Hello, I'm Sue Romna from Edison Group. Thank you for joining this Paradigm uh, Biopharma webinar. It's my pleasure to kick off this discussion about Paradigm six-month data. Management will share their presentation and we'll follow that up with a brief Q&A. Today, we're joined by Paul Rennie, Managing Director and Chairman, Dr. Donna Skerritt, Chief Medical Officer, and Dr. Mukesh Ahuja, Global Head of OA. If you have any questions during this presentation, please feel free to submit them throughout the tab at the bottom of your Zoom panel. We'll address as many questions following management's presentations as we can. Paul, I'll hand that over to you here. Thank you very much, Sue. And I'd like to thank Edison for the opportunity uh, to present to uh, shareholders today. I'd also like to thank uh, shareholders and uh, other interested parties uh, for attending our presentation today. What, what I'd like to do at the start of this presentation, I realize that um, not everyone in the United States is familiar or as familiar with Paradigm Biopharma as our investors in Australia are. We have been on the uh, Australian Stock Exchange since 2015, and we have many long-term investors who know the story very well. So what I'd like to do is just uh, do a little recap and explain to you really the um, essence of what we're trying to communicate to you today. So first of all, the vast majority of the data that you'll see today will be around um, this phase two clinical study called PARA-08008. Now, this is a phase two study that Paradigm initiated for a particular purpose, which I'll explain in a minute, but it initiated this while at the same time commencing its pivotal phase three clinical study, which is PARA-002. Now, in relation to PARA-008, which is a phase two study, it's a small study comprising 61 subjects, roughly 20 subjects per arm uh, of either placebo, once a week pentazan polysulfate sodium, or twice a week pentazan polysulfate sodium. The primary endpoint of this study has been met. It was a successful outcome, which was reported in October 2022. So the study has reached its primary endpoint, which was day 56. So day 56, after the drug had been administered over a uh, dosing period of six weeks, uh, two weeks later, we did our primary uh, analysis and that primary endpoint was met. And we did a secondary follow-up, which was investigating the clinical outcomes of people on this study. Uh, and the same clinical outcomes are the uh, primary endpoints for our pivotal phase, two, uh, phase three clinical study that is changed from baseline in both WOMAC pain and function. And that was statistically significant at day 56. So this study we're talking about today has been a successful phase two as defined by meeting its primary endpoint. However, we felt that given some of our earlier data from another phase two B study that we conducted back in uh, 2019, what we found was that there were significant signs or signals that this drug that we're talking about today uh, may have some disease modifying potential. So we wanted to, from an exploratory perspective, investigate whether this drug had disease modifying signals. So even though some of the signals were unexpected by um, uh, industry experts, we felt that they were very important signals um, some of the signals were strong enough to give statistical significance over placebo. Others showed very strong trends. So we put that into context of understanding that a study showing very positive signals trending to significance on 20 subjects is probably going to reach significance when you increase that study size to several hundred people. So just putting that into perspective, 78% of the people in this study were KL grade three or four. So we're talking about um, people with moderate to severe osteoarthritis. And so it's obviously that's the group or, or the um, population with uh, now quite severe pain and other uh, morbidities associated with osteoarthritis. So it is a challenging uh, uh, group of subjects because they have established osteoarthritis and in significant pain. 
So with that as the background, I'd like to go to the next slide, please. Uh, as an ASX listed company, we are required by our, our rules and regulations to highlight um, the disclaimer and uh, caution around forward looking statements. Next slide, please. A little bit about Paradigm. As I mentioned earlier, on the left hand side of the panel, you can see that Paradigm is an Australian public company founded in 2014, listed on the Australian Stock Exchange in 2015. Uh, moving to the centre of the, the presentation, we can see that pentazan polysulfate sodium, the drug that we're talking about, which is a proven molecule, is administered to subjects in subcutaneous form. So we're not talking about intra-articular injection. We are talking about a subcutaneous injection, very similar to all of the uh, monoclonal antibodies on the market today, like Humira, which um, as a subcutaneous injection could ultimately be uh, turned into a self-administration, uh, a product that can be self-administered. Uh, this particular drug, pentazan polysulfate sodium, or PPS, or IPPS as we refer to it, is a non-opioid drug with a 60-year track record history of treating pain, inflammation, and thrombosis in humans. The uh, lead programs um, for Paradigm is investigating pentazan polysulfate sodium, or IPPS, or also trademarked as xylosol, in uh, the condition of osteoarthritis. So as I mentioned at the outset, xylosol is currently in a global phase three clinical study, and it's being studied with the primary endpoint of uh, change in pain from baseline at day 56 for both WOMAP pain and function. The US FDA has granted this program uh, fast track. We do have a globally harmonized protocol so that we can post the phase three, get simultaneous approval in all the key jurisdictions. So the same protocol is being accepted by the EMA, for example. Um, so we are able to um, get simultaneous registration once the trial is finished. Um, the, the drug administered subcutaneously is over a six week treatment course. And what we're gonna talk about today uh, uh, in the PARA008 study, which is a phase two study, we're going to talk about the uh, results that we're seeing at the six month time point. So bear in mind, these people have had a, a six week um, course of the drug, uh, which is ad administered once a week or twice a week for six weeks. And now six months on, we're now seeing the results and we want to talk to you about those today. Our second program is an orphan indication. It's currently in a phase two study uh, in the ultra rare disease of MPS6. We've just finished a phase two study of MPS1 in Australia. Um, PPS has demonstrated potential to treat the residual pain that the MPS patients experience, albeit that they are on enzyme replacement therapy. So enzyme replacement therapy does have a um, uh, lack of treating the residual pain for these patients. And so PPS added in conjunction with uh, the standard of care being enzyme replacement therapy, um, looks to attenuate their pain. So we see this as adjunctive therapy to standard of care being enzyme replacement therapy or bone marrow transplant. Through a number of phase two studies, um, Paradigm has been able to prove that uh, we see meaningful treatment effects compared to placebo for pain, activities of daily living, uh, joint stiffness, uh, function and PGIC. Uh, we have treated over 700 subjects in Australia under um, the federal government's special access scheme uh, administered by the Therapeutic Goods Administration of Australia. And we have treated uh, 10 subjects in the United States uh, under the FDA's approved expanded access program. And we have collected these data, although it's not a clinical study, it is still nonetheless very important clinical data uh, representing real world evidence of people who have osteoarthritis and have been treated with the drug. Next slide, please. Okay, so I'm going to touch on the highlights of this um, six month readout. Again, bear in mind, these people have uh, received their drug uh, six months ago, either once a week or twice a week for six weeks. And now we're looking at their uh, outcomes at the six month time point. These, these are not pivotal endpoints, 
these are exploratory uh, measures that we've undertaken with this phase two study. Uh, at day 56, the primary endpoint was achieved, as I mentioned, um, and it was also, um, or the primary endpoint was a change in one synovial fluid biomarker compared to placebo. And Paradigm reported seven uh, favorable changes in synovial fluid biomarkers compared to placebo. So we actually saw disease markers going down in the PPS group and going up in placebo. Uh, we also got statistically significant improvements at day 56 in pain at 0 0.05 and at function at 0 0.017 and overall WOMAX scores for twice weekly IPPS compared to the placebo arm. So what is important here, I think, is that this is the same primary endpoint that we are using with the FDA, which is changed from baseline at day 56 in WOMAC pain. And we've proven in this phase two study in a very small uh, uh, group of patients, only 20 per group, that we are getting a statistically significant readout at day 56. And that encourages us for our phase three study, obviously. Now, in addition to those um, outstanding outcomes, we have got multiple signals at day 168 or six months of disease modifying efficacy of IPPS following a six week treatment. So they've had their treatment, now we're six months on and we're seeing signals of disease modification. Objective measures of MRI at day 168 demonstrated changes in several structural uh, features of the joint, uh, which are consistent with disease modifying efficacy. And most notably, we saw improvements in cartilage loss in the PPS group, whereas we saw uh, advanced cart cartilage loss in the placebo group. Uh, bone marrow lesions and uh, marginal osteophytes were also reduced in the PPS groups, and they are very important markers for disease uh, progression, the bone marrow lesions and, and osteophytes. Now, industry experts have told us that um, when we get to looking at biomarkers, synovial fluid biomarkers, the really the key four biomarkers that we should look at are these biomarkers of AGR, A, RGS, C2C, COMP, and CTX2. Now, if you're not familiar with these, what these represent, these are pieces of the cartilage matrix. The ARGS is a piece of agrican, and when it's broken down by specific enzymes, they're broken into pieces. These pieces can be detected through analytic, analytical techniques in synovial fluid taken from the patient. So we have seen that all of these uh, key biomarkers for disease modification, ARGS, C2C, COMP and CTX2, all moved in the opposite direction to uh, the placebo at six months. And some of our industry experts are wildly excited about these data. This has never been shown before in a um, controlled phase two clinical study. So this is a very exciting outcome. Uh, we also saw durable positive clinical responses in WOMAP pain, function, stiffness, and overall WOMAP uh, score. And post day 56, we saw that rescue medication was used over four times more in the placebo group compared to twice weekly IPPS through to the six month time frame. So we're seeing rescue medication being used in the placebo group at a much higher rate than the PPS treated population which does introduce some um, uh, positive bias for the placebo. But despite that, we haven't seen the, um, the line for the PPS pain moving back towards the um, placebo line. Um, so we're actually um, quite excited to see, despite the increase in the um, rescue medication, which is um, paracetamol, very similar to acetaminophen, or NSAIDs, um, those uh, drugs have not been able to drop placebo down to the same effect as uh, PPS, albeit that PPS was administered six months ago. Next slide, please. Okay, so this is my final slide, and um, I'd like to just uh, remind uh, people if they've heard the story before or people new to the story, why would a company be interested in pursuing a disease modifying potential for its drug. 
I think the, the first and probably one of the most important reasons why a company would want to pursue that is that patients and doctors desperately want a drug that will give them symptomatic relief. So reduce their pain, improve their function, reduce the stiffness of the joint, but at the same time, give them some hope that the disease is not going to progress to the end stage and therefore require a total knee replacement. I think many of us consider ourselves to be too young to um, be going in for total joint replacement. So there is a very strong demand from people who have osteoarthritis to stave off the disease as long as possible. And we also know doctors feel the same way. They want a drug that's safe and effective and can also possibly um, re reverse or slow down the progression to end-stage disease. And it's important that uh, people understand that currently there are no approved disease-modifying osteoarthritis drugs for osteoarthritis. We also know that 81% of OA patients are dissatisfied with the current OA therapies, and that was from a peer-reviewed publication. And Paradigm uh, commissioned its own uh, global market research in 2021 and spoke specifically to payers around um, what the impact of disease-modifying label for IPPS and reimbursement would be. And so what we um, took from that research was that if there was a disease-modifying label, then this drug would probably move from second-line uh, therapy into the of the treatment algorithm to first-line therapy and therefore be used more regularly and increase the overall demand for the product. We also know that reimbursement uh, agencies would consider disease-modifying label as being very positive in terms of pharmacoeconomics and staving off a joint replacement and therefore attract a higher reimbursement price. The prices that we were quoted was for a pain and function label only of around two and a half thousand dollars uh, per course of treatment. So that's um, six or 12 injections over that six week period or um, disease modifying label where the price would then move to uh, $6,000 per course of injection. So it makes a significant and profound impact on the, the commercial opportunity here. And it's not the only reason why we're pursuing it, but obviously from an investor's point of view, there is a blockbuster opportunity here in the treatment of osteoarthritis for safe and effective drugs, even if it's just for treatment of pain. But when you move into this disease modifying space, um, the, the numbers just get incredibly large. And I think, you know, as an industry, we've seen what's happened with some uh, disease modifying drugs, such as the anti-TNF therapy used for treatment of disease modifying in a rheumatoid arthritis situation, rheumatoid arthritis being only one tenth the um, incidence of um, osteoarthritis. But having said that, um, we know that Humira uh, over the last 20 years, uh, since it first came onto the market, um, has generated over $200 billion um, because it's moved from uh, symptomatic treatment in rheumatoid arthritis to disease modification. So disease modification completely shifts the paradigm to a, a different set of numbers. And in this, in the case of osteoarthritis, we're talking about um, possibly shifting it into you know, $10 billion per annum, up to $20 billion per annum. And those figures are not unreasonable given that that's the sort of average figure that um, AbV got from Humira over the 20 year period. So that's um, my introduction and I'll now pass over to my colleague, Dr. Donna Skerritt, who is Paradigm's Chief Medical Officer based in New York. Thank you, Donna. Thank you, Paul. So now I'd like to go into a little further detail around the disease modifying uh, aspects of the programs that Paul has mentioned to you. Uh, as he mentioned previously, we conducted a study, PARA-005. It's a completed study. It was 126 participants randomized to PPS or placebo. The dosage was two milligrams per kilogram twice weekly for six weeks versus placebo. And uh, in addition to the very nice clinical responses that we saw in that study, we did get some signals about uh, biomarkers and MRI. 
And that is that with the biomarkers, we saw reductions in serum levels of COMP as well as Adam's TS5 and a reduction in the urinary levels of CTX2. And these are all markers of cartilage uh, degradation. So seeing a reduction in these suggests that we have some preservation of the cartilage in the PTS treated arm compared to the placebo arm. On the MRIs, uh, these patients uh, had uh, bone marrow edema lesions at, um, at entry into study. And the follow-up MRIs uh, indicated that um, we saw clinically meaningful reduction in the PTS group compared to placebo. So these were two very nice signals regarding biomarkers and MRI findings suggesting disease-modifying potential for uh, PTS in OA. So as you've heard, we then uh, initiated this study, para oa 8 which is uh, ongoing in terms of the 12-month follow-up. We've randomized 61 participants into this study, and they received a dose of 2 milligrams per kg once weekly, twice weekly, or placebo. And as you've heard, the primary endpoint here was to achieve uh, uh, some signals in this no real fluid biomarkers. Why were these a focus of this study? Uh, in the prior study, we showed that we could measure serum mark biomarkers that gave us clues about cartilage preservation. Uh, given that this drug is delivered by a subcutaneous injection, we wanted to get some evidence of the effects of this drug in the knee itself, and that was done by examining the synovial fluid. So at day 56, we saw signals from several uh, biomarkers in the synovial fluid. We saw reductions in inflammatory cytokines, TNF and IL-6. We saw reduction in the pain mediator, NGF. We also saw a reduction in byproducts of cartilage degradation, COMP and ARBs, and an increase in an endogenous inhibitor of cartilage degrading enzymes, and that's TIMP1. So again, we're now looking at synovial fluid biomarkers, uh, seeing evidence of this at day 56, which is the same time when we evaluate our clinical endpoint for our primary uh, primary endpoint for our phase three program as well. Next slide. So these findings are consistent with our understanding of the mechanisms of action of PPS. We know that primarily through NF kappa B, we have effects on inflammatory pathways, pain through NGF. Uh, tissue preservation through a number of pathways, and as, as well as improved uh, local circulation, which may be aiding in the uh, reduction of bone marrow edema lesions. Next slide. So more on the findings at day 168 from PARA-008. This biomarker study wanted to look at um, changes from baseline and multiple objective measures associated with disease progression of OA. I mentioned we have 61 participants receiving once or twice weekly dosing or placebo. And the follow-up period out to this, of this study is out to 12 months. So we're now at, uh, reporting data at six months and have previously reported data at day 56. At day 56, we did see multiple biomarkers that uh, provided insight into the mechanisms and disease modifying potential. We also showed at day 56 that we had statistically significant improvement in WOMAC pain, function, stiffness, and overall WOMAC score for the twice weekly arm. And so this is the endpoint that would be comparable to our, our phase three program endpoint. We saw significant changes in pain and function. We noted that significant changes in pain and function were not apparent in the once weekly IPPS group compared to placebo. So the strongest clinical findings were seen in this twice weekly uh, treatment group. Next slide. In terms of trying to understand what's going on structurally, uh, the tools that are most informative to us are the MRI examination of the knee. And that's because with MRI, you can uh, get a greater detailed information around bone marrow lesions, joint synovitis, cartilage thickness, uh, bone shape, uh, uh, including osteophytes, and joint space width. So whereas traditionally um, an x-ray was used to measure joint space width, 
we're able to get much more information, including joint space width, by looking at MRI. And the findings in these various regions of the bone will uh, correlate to uh, certain types of pathology in the bone, and those are listed on the right column of this slide as well. The findings in the day 168 assessment uh, by MRI uh, provided us with uh, signals that um, uh, were uh, often difficult to detect as early as six months. Um, uh, very often, we're advised that it's more likely that we will see changes at 12 months. Uh, but we were very uh, pleased to see that there were um, measurable changes in the MRI findings at uh, six months. And for a further description of those findings, I will uh, pass on to Dr. Makesh Ahuja uh, to describe the MRI findings. Next slide, please. <clears throat> Thank you, Donna. Um, welcome, everyone, uh, for joining Paradigm um, and uh, to um, for us to share with you uh, the results of the Para OA008 study. So here I will present uh, the day 168 top line data for from the MRI based semi quantitative scoring system called WORMS. So WORMS is an abbreviation for whole organ magnetic resonance score, which is a comprehensive scoring system used uh, extensively in OA studies worldwide. The MRI images uh, were re read by an independent organization with trained musculoskeletal radiologists for accurate and reliable reading. The MRI images were obtained at two different time points. First, at the screening visit at which pretreatment OA disease characteristics were established. And then follow-up MRIs were obtained at day 168 which is six month follow-up to identify differences in disease progression between the IPPS and placebo group. It is important to note here that despite the relatively small number of subjects in each arm of this study and the short follow-up interval compared to the generally slow structural progression on osteoarthritis, changes consistent with D-mode efficacy were observed in a number of disease features. The structural changes were most noticeable in cartilage, bone marrow lesions, and osteophytes. With the next slide, I will share key findings for, three, for these three disease features. The first one is cartilage loss, which is known to be the most important disease feature for osteoarthritis. It's, uh, it's also considered uh, the joint space width, which is a surrogate for cartilage loss. Um, so with this uh, worms scoring system, we have directly looked at the cartilage loss score. Uh, it's also considered to be predictive and clinically relevant endpoint for uh, knee replacement surgery. In the para oa 8 study, once weekly IPPS cohort showed an average improvement of 21% in mean cartilage loss score in the medial femur, whereas the placebo arm showed a 4% worsening of cartilage loss. The twice weekly IPPS group showed stabilization of cartilage compared to the placebo. The next disease feature with a statistically informative change is bone marrow lesions. Bone marrow lesions are related to microtrauma resulting from overloading caused by, caused by loss of normal bearing function of articular cartilage. Numerous studies have suggested bone marrow lesions are also predictive of knee replacement. In this study, bone marrow lesions in the lateral femur decreased by an average 38% in the once weekly IPPS arm whereas in the placebo arm, it increased by 47%. In the entire lateral tibiofemoral compartment, bone marrow lesions decreased by an average 17% in the once weekly IPPS arm, whereas increased by 56% in the placebo arm. Twice weekly IPPS group showed improvement compared to placebo. Next slide, please. Marginal osteophytes, also known as bone spurs, these are osseous outgrowths and is a common feature of osteoarthritis. They are believed to form as an adaptive response to mechanical stimulation or inflammatory cytokines, according to more recent research. The osteophytes increase in number of and size of and size as the OA disease pro progresses. As shown in this figure, with the increase in Calgary and Lawrence osteoarthritis grading, 
increase in severity of osteophytes is seen. So in this study, osteophytes decreased or remained stable in all three compartments of the knee in patients treated with IPPS compared to an increase in the placebo arm. Uh, with that, I will yield back to Dr. Don Escaret uh, to go over clinical and molecular biomarker results and also discuss about the next steps. Thank you, Mikesh. So at day 168, the following clinical changes were observed. The twice weekly IPPS group demonstrated durable responses and Womack scores for pain, function, stiffness, and overall Womack index compared to placebo. Specifically, we saw durable Womack pain reduction. We saw Womack function achieve 50% improvement for 53.3% of the twice weekly cohort compared to 22% in the placebo group. We saw PGIC was favorable at day 168, a strong trend. And we saw that at day 112, IPPS showed Womack stiffness was significant, function was a high trend, and overall also a very high trend in terms of improvement for the PPS group compared to placebo. Importantly, uh, the placebo group used rescue medications four times as often as the twice weekly IPPS group. So in other words, the PPS group was improving in pain and therefore improving in function. Uh, but with that improvement in function, we didn't see a recurrence of pain requiring them to start taking medication. So we reduced uh, 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 medication use in the PPS group by about fourfold. Next slide. This is an overview of the molecular biomarkers that have potential as uh, identifying disease modifying uh, aspects for PPS for OA. We've uh, spoken to the first two categories previously, where at day 56 we showed uh, favorable changes in uh, pro inflammatory cytokine reduction and also reduction in the pain mediator nerve growth factor. And previously, we've seen some changes in the serum and para-005, uh, but many more uh, biomarkers were explored in this study in order to understand uh, relationships between serum, synovial fluid, and urine uh, biomarkers, and to also understand if we were seeing consistent and concordance changes in biomarkers uh, suggesting disease-modifying potential. Next slide, please. So the day 168 biomarker results include evaluation of synovial fluid serum and urine biomarkers. And the IPPS groups just uh, identified disease-modifying potential in the OA treatment as demonstrated by alterations in four of the biomarkers. These four biomarkers are all related in that they all are uh, connected to uh, cartilage uh, breakdown and therefore the identification of these as uh, concordant with the um, mechanism of cartilage preservation. Synovial fluid and serum samples of ARGs and COP show favorable changes for PPS compared to placebo. And the serum C2C and urinary CTX2 also demonstrated beneficial effects for PPS compared to placebo. And next slide, please. And just to give you an idea of um, uh, the concordance between uh, serum and synovial fluid biomarkers, uh, we wanted to show that uh, C2C in the serum was reduced and that reduction was uh, statistically significant compared to placebo. For CTX, the finding was reduced. Uh, for COMP in uh, the serum and uh, the synovial fluid, both of these were uh, reduced compared to placebo. And similarly for ARGs, uh, the synovial fluid and the serum markers were reduced compared to placebo with the synovial fluid reduction reaching statistical significance at 0.024. So again, these are all biomarkers of cartilage degradation 
where IPPS treated subjects showed favorable profile compared to placebo control, thus providing us with a concordant uh, profile of biomarkers to use when assessing uh, disease modifying activity of uh, PPS for uh, uh, acquiring additional uh, data in support of a D-mode uh, label. Next slide, please. So in terms of what our next steps are, um, we have acquired uh, a lot of new data. We have MRI, uh, molecular biomarker and clinical outcome data, which will be presented to the regulatory authorities, the primary meetings planned are for the FDA and EMA. And we will have discussions with these groups uh, during the second half of this year in order to understand what additional data and how those data should be um, uh, evaluated and analyzed in our larger controlled study, para 5 in order to provide data that would be acceptable for obtaining a disease-modifying label uh, language in addition to the primary endpoint label for our phase three study, which is pain and function. This activity is not expected to uh, impact the paradigm uh, clinical timelines for OA. Uh, as I mentioned, we will have these regulatory discussions within the coming months in order to uh, include the biomarker uh, endpoints in the design of the uh, confirmatory study para 3 We have previously announced that this program has fast track designation with the FDA and that facilitates easier access to the agency and an opportunity for frequent dialogue on the development program. Uh, feedback from EMA will also be useful to us in terms of uh, our next steps in uh, with approaching the TGA regarding their provisional approval program. The data set from day 56 and now day 168 time points in para 8 uh, will be prepared for peer review uh, and publication. Uh, we have acquired uh, a, a, a large data set now of uh, molecular biomarker data, including synovial fluid, serum, and urine biomarkers. We have acquired now MRI data, which is showing changes uh, at six months in PPS compared to uh, placebo subjects. And these are both areas of uh, great interest to the osteoarthritis community and uh, to those who are specifically interested in identifying uh, biomarkers as surrogates of response uh, for OA development. Next slide, please. I'd now like to say a quick word about the phase three program. I've mentioned uh, that we've uh, conducted and completed an, a phase two program, 005. Uh, the data we presented to you today is from 008. Uh, six month data are uh, available now, although these patients will be followed out to 12 months, so there will be additional data on them. Uh, we are currently enrolling in OA002, which is our pivotal study. It has two stages and the dose finding stage, uh, which is evaluating three different doses compared to placebo, is expected to complete enrollment by the end of June this year. Following dose selection, we will then um, uh, move into our confirmatory uh, uh, phase three study uh, 003. So we have, we'll have data from two phase three studies as we go into uh, registration submissions. Uh, both of our phase three studies have extension arms, so we will follow patients out uh, to uh, 12 months in order to uh, acquire duration of effect data. And given uh, that uh, OA is a chronic disease and our feedback from uh, many patients who have received uh, PPS through the SAS program in Australia, we will use our duration of effect data to design a retreatment protocol in order to have controlled data on retreatment responses. And we also, uh, as we previously mentioned, will uh, uh, initiate a program for uh, OA of the hip since it has a similar 
regulatory pathway for OAM for me, and that will be developed once we have the dose selection complete. So I now move to the next slide and hand over to Paul for wrap up. Thanks very much, uh, Simon and uh, Sue. I just finish off this uh, last slide, which is the near term news flow for investors, um, so that I can then hand over uh, back to you. Um, as I mentioned at the outset, um, Paradigm has a number of programs. Uh, we have the osteoarthritis program, our lead program, but we also have um, a program uh, in phase two for the ultra rare disease of MPS6. And we will be announcing shortly the finalisation of the recruitment of that study, which will be in the second quarter of this calendar year. So that's uh, imminent. Um, as we're running our phase two and phase three studies, as you've heard, we're also running a canine OA model. Um, our scientists tell us that the canine OA model, um, being the natural uh, osteoarthritis, not an experimentally induced osteoarthritis, very uh, nicely translates into a similar outcome uh, in humans. So it is a natural history OA model. And the advantage of looking at um, disease biomarkers in canines is that they are age much quicker than humans. So therefore a 26 follow-up in canines is equivalent to a three-year equivalent in humans. So that data will be out before the end of uh, June, this calendar year. And we are um, seeing some very um, uh, interesting outcomes from that study. Um, Para002, which is our, our pivotal phase three clinical st study, we'll be updating recruitment on that um, towards the end of Q2 this calendar year. Uh, of course, um, as we've just heard, Para008, which is a phase two study, um, we, we discussed that the um, study was successful. It met its endpoints at day 56, but exploratory um, work showed that we do have very significant signals of disease modification at six months, and we'll be reporting the 12 month follow up from all of those patients in the second half of this calendar year 2023. Um, we will be also presenting the NPS1, which was a phase two study conducted in Australia, and the NPS6 phase two clinical studies uh, will be reporting those uh, top line data uh, the end of Q4 this calendar year 2023. And Paradigm is uh, currently in active discussions with multiple potential partners for its phase two asset, uh, the orphan indication of mucopolysaccharidosis. And that um, continues to progress and become very interesting uh, as we just had the World Congress uh, meeting in Orlando, Florida. Uh, we had a lot of interest from uh, investigators uh, inquiring about the trial, a lot of people from MPS Society is very interested because this is one of very few double-blind placebo-controlled study in an ultra-rare disease. Most um, ultra-rare diseases are open-label studies, but this is double-blind placebo-controlled study. So that um, is the end of our presentation. So I'm going to hand back to Sue, who will now um, uh, forward some of the questions that have been received throughout the presentation. So back to you, Sue. Thank you, Paul. We have a lot of questions here today. If we don't get to your questions, we'll do our best to follow up with you directly. The first question has three parts. Here's the first part. Uh, could management please comment on the differentiation in the cartilage degeneration data in the once weekly group versus the twice weekly group? Uh, I can, uh, I'll take that question. Mm -hmm. So yeah, overall the cartilage score, uh, we use, uh, as I explained earlier, we use Worms cartilage loss score. So overall the score was a stable in twice weekly group and improved in once weekly as compared to placebo, which means there was no meaningful cartilage degradation identified in twice weekly and possibly a, you know, it's a signal that there might be regeneration in once weekly growth. So I, I can, I'm cautiously optimistic about it, but um, the improvement in cartilage loss score in once weekly was very encouraging and that in twice weekly, the cartilage score was still stable. 
Okay. Uh, the second one, uh, could the twice weekly group have a better reduction in pain and thus been more mobile than the first, uh, the once a week group causing fa faster cartilage degeneration? Um, so <clears throat> I'll, I'll take that question as well. Um, so our answer to the first part of question is likely yes. And second, for the second part, uh, we did not find any evidence of faster cartilage degradation in twice weekly. Mukesh, one, one quick last follow-up to that. Um, considering the difference in the once weekly group better than the disease modifying results uh, versus twice weekly group better pain function, will this cause problem in choosing the dose scheduling going forward? Um, no, I don't. We don't think so. The dose selection is based on pain function and safety data up to day eighty-four. Okay, um, Paul. Maybe this is for you. Uh, where do we expect IPPS to be launched first? Well, um, I think uh, IPPS will probably be launched first um, in the United States. Um, obviously, the United States is the world's largest market. Um, we are doing our phase three, our pivotal phase three study in the United States. Um, so that's our, our plan. I think the timing, uh, as you probably saw from the slide from Dr. Skerritt, is we'll be submitting our um, request for registration via an NDA to the US FDA um, towards the end of uh, 2025. And we would hope that um, first revenues would occur within the months after that submission. Um, I should also just say that um, due to the, um, the way that this study has been designed, um, if we continue to explore disease modification and have a disease modification label, that will not extend the time to revenues. The disease modification uh, studies can be done within the, within the phase three studies that are either ongoing or about to commence. So the uh, pivotal study is ongoing uh, and we can, at the end of the uh, dose selection, incorporate changes in the protocol to collect disease modification label, uh, disease modification data for a disease modification label, or we can get the disease modification data from the confirmatory study, which is PARA003, and that will uh, commence after the dose selection in uh, PARA002. Donna, this one might be for you here. Uh, how remarkable is the improvement in cartilage? Um, has that has there ever been achieved in humans? The um, concordance between improvement in MRI as well as um, the uh, molecular uh, changes seen in the biomarkers. Uh, with clinical improvement as uh, uh, particularly unique to, um, to this program. So we consider these very strong uh, signals for uh, disease modification along with clinical uh, effects for PPS. So this is, uh, uh, you know, <laughs> always be cautious because we will be acquiring more data, but uh, we consider this uh, really remarkable uh, findings to see, especially at six months. Yeah. So okay. I, I might just, sorry, so could I, could I just jump yeah. in there? I, I completely agree with Donna. And one of the things that I do is obviously from a commercial perspective, keep an eye on what is out there in the market. And I'd have to say at this point in time, there is no um, previous study that has actually shown um, improvements in cartilage to the extent that we've shown in this particular study. So I think it is really um, a world first and quite groundbreaking. Um, the other thing I'd like to mention is that um, <clears throat> in addition to cartilage, I don't think that there has ever been a drug registered where um, the, the subject is dosed and six months later, um, the effect is, is still significant. So I think that's another um, important aspect of this of this drug. Um, you, you do the administration and you get long-term durable effect from the symptoms of pain 
and uh, joint stiffness. So I, I think it really is quite a unique uh, outcome, the data that's been seen at six months. Um, when do you anticipate having enough information to know the dosage you'll use throughout the larger upcoming 002 and 003? That's planned to occur as part of an interim analysis um, for the first stage of Para 002, which is enrolling now. The uh, schedule for uh, completing enrollment is uh, by end of June this year. And so within a few months following that, we should have our dose selection completed. Okay. Um, the potential to maximize the impact of IPPS by demonstrating a disease modifying profile in the KOA in phase two para OA 008 trial. It's very exciting. And then the six month data is particularly encouraging. What do you believe are the most important outcomes for the 12 month data? And what do you believe the FDN EMA will need um, for the uh, disease modifying indication labeling? Sure, I'll comment to that. Um, so traditionally disease modification has required evidence of uh, structural uh, preservation. Uh, initially, that was determined by joint space narrowing. Uh, more recently, some of the uh, other findings, particularly those around preservation of cartilage, have been uh, reviewed um, by advisory groups uh, working with the FDA. So uh, when we think about the difference between six months and 12 months, uh, it would be ideal to see uh, the uh, persistence of these favorable structural changes. Um, the reason we have interest in, in, in some of these uh, structural changes is because some of them have been correlated with uh, deferring or uh, the need for a, a total knee replacement. So when you think about the long-term clinical endpoint, what sort of uh, structural evidence um, can we provide that will be sort of a surrogate for that longer term uh, outcome of total knee replacement, which is really more challenging to uh, prove in the clinic. So I would say certainly to see persistence in the structural changes, uh, also perhaps to uh, be able to correlate some of the um, molecular biomarker findings with uh, changes in structure as well. Because again, we have clinical evidence, we see that it's durable. It would be good to have an understanding of, you know, if these um, the biomarkers that are showing us some uh, uh, preservation of cartilage and slowing down that degradation uh, activity, um, what does that mean later down the line in terms of the structural findings? So all of these will be evaluated by our statistical group. Okay, in, in reference to the pivotal um, PARA OA002 phase three trial to assess the long-term efficacy and safety of IPPS in patients with AOA pain, is patient enrollment pro progressing as planned? And, and can we expect to hear an update from the study? Uh, I would yeah. say Makesh, who is the champion of uh, the enrollment, should speak to that. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Donna. So, yeah, we are very excited. Uh, we have um, about close to 100, 100 sites activated globally on this study, and the enrollment is uh, going rapidly. And uh, we have pretty much doubled up our recruitment rate in the last two and a half months. So, uh, yeah, we are um, very excited about the recruitment base for O2 study. Okay, maybe a couple more. Um, is the preparation for confirmatory phase three um, para OA003 trial progressing as anticipated? And are you still planning to initiate this in um, calendar year 23? Makesh, do you want to speak to that? Or? Yeah, so um, for O03 study, uh, O03 study will be is planned to be to initiated once we have selected the dose from stage one, um, from stage one of O02, 
uh, that's when uh, we will also initiate our phase uh, uh, phase three confirmatory study over three, uh, which is expected um, to happen uh, sometime later this year. Okay. Uh, and the 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 treatment um, para OA 09 trial expected to initiate in calendar 24 to assess the feasibility of multiple treatment regimens for IPPS. Do you anticipate the results from the study will have significant influence on the company's clinical development plans for IPPS? I'll take that. Um, I don't know that it will have a significant impact on the development plan. Uh, the development plan is pretty much laid out before you, as you saw on that timeline. What this will uh, provide for us are controlled data around uh, retreatment. And we have experience with several hundred patients in the SAS program in Australia. So we know from those patients that they come back sometimes a year, a year and a half, saying they are sensing that the effects of their initial treatment are wearing off. Can they be considered for retreatment? We would need to document that in um, a controlled study, which is um, uh, what we're doing with the extension study data. And then around that design, what retreatment should uh, look like for a trial, just to put some retreatment data in, in front of the agency but I don't see that having an impact on the development plan, major impact, yeah. Okay, um, maybe this last one here, uh, period uh, calendar 23, 25, it, it looks like it's particularly active. Um, what's the company's strategic priorities for this period and what do you believe are the most significant near-term catalysts for investors to look for? Well, um, I might um, take that uh, question. Thanks, Sue. Um, so in terms of near-term catalysts, I, I'm not sure if they still appear on the screen. Um, I can see them on, on my screen, um, but essentially what they are is, um, if, if we sort of generalise them, it means a readout of um, the orphan indication top-line data towards the end of this calendar year. Um, we also see a further readout of this particular study, 008, um, at the 12-month follow-up from all of these subjects. Um, we'll also have an update on the uh, pivotal study um, towards the end of June, uh, an update on recruitment rates and um, any news thereafter about dose selection. Um, and the other um, piece of information would be mainly um, possibility of some sort of commercial transaction around a licensing of the uh, orphan indication to a company interested in developing um, or orphan uh, treatments for orphan diseases. So we, we do have um, quite a number of uh, commercial companies interested in both the um, MPS asset as well as the osteoarthritis asset. And I think the, the data that we've just seen, uh, again, noting that 008 did meet its primary endpoint. We're encouraged that that endpoint is the same as the pivotal and confirmatory study, change in pain from baseline at day 56. Um, we, we met that with statistical significance on a very small um, number of subjects. We would hope that that would give investors confidence that the uh, same endpoint in a much larger group of patients would be a positive outcome. Um, but having said that, um, I, I think what we're really looking for is that, um, as, as Dr. Skerritt said, maybe a continuation of the structural improvement um, at the 12 month endpoint. And if that's the case, then I think, you know, um, that would be the point for us to be able to really come to a, a, a value on this asset to be able to establish a, um, uh, an equitable financial transaction in relation to the osteoarthritis asset. We're going to squeeze one more in. I know I, I said that the last couple of times. Uh, is exercise undertaken by patients during the study controlled or tracked for the three groups from, from your learnings in the study? Is this something that you would build in the confirmatory 003 study? If I can address that with regards to the design 
of the phase three program, um, patients may exercise, of course, uh, they are asked um, to refrain from initiating any new, very aggressive program. So for example, if they're doing physical therapy to continue with that, um, we do track that activity. Um, it is important to track that as, uh, as, as it is also important to track uh, all the medications that are used. Um, but as patients feel better, they uh, do want to do more. And so we, you know, we, we do keep um, uh, data around how active they are. Okay, great. Um, that's really all the time we have for questions here today. Thank you everyone for joining here. Um, if you have any other additional questions or we didn't get to your questions, or if you'd like to speak to the team one-on-one, -on -one, please reach out to the contact information listed on the Paradigm website. Thank you. Thank you.